Hey, hello, everybody. And this is Stacey Chalemi from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we will have one of our podcast community hosts. He has a podcast of his own on our channel, and he is the founder of Moral Eats. His name is Sandra Van Stee. He has a passion for regenerative agriculture. And I'm so glad to have him on the show today. Uh, He is one of our famous guests. He is very popular and people love to hear what he has to say because he has such an insight on agriculture, food, health, and many more topics. Today, he'd like to talk about the future of agriculture and how regenerative agriculture can help our world and how it could be the future of our world today. So, Sandra, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and, you know, tell us about your thoughts today about um, changing the world with regenerative ag- agriculture. Absolutely. I I, um, I always, I have a unique perspective on it because I see it from both sides of the agriculture uh, fence, basically. We, I, I grew up on a commercial dairy farm. I still run a commercial dairy farm. But then on the side now, we're trying to grow um, the regenerative regenerative managed uh, part of our farm with hopefully the goal is to grow our brand, grow more leads to the point where we can transition our our entire farm over to regenerative agriculture practices. There are some there are some huge advantages to regenerative agriculture there. It's very sustainable and. Um, it helps to improve the environment by sequestering those greenhouse gases and and storing them in the soil, and then also there's there's lots of benefits for uh, the welfare, the welfare perspective of it, and that's something that I'm personally very passionate about is trying to improve the lives of farm animals. That's the mission of Moral Eats, and then also there's huge benefits as far as nutrient density, the health of the food that we actually produce because. In the past 70, 80 years, there's been a, a continuous trend to a decrease in the nutrient density in the food that we find in our grocery store. So regenerative agriculture has the ability to fix a lot of issues that we have with commercial agriculture. With that being said, though, commercial agriculture is has, has its own strengths. And I feel like whenever I hear other people speaking about it in the regenerative space, it's something that I find is commonly missed, where like commercial agriculture is the way it is for a reason. It's it's responding to supply and demand. And there's there's a, a, a strong demand for the way food is produced in commercial agriculture. And that is basically efficiency and scale. You need to feed the whole world, but also you need to do it in a way that people can afford to buy their groceries. And if there is any weakness to regenerative agriculture, that would be the main one, is that it's still a premium product that costs more to produce food in this way. And for example, when you're feeding grass-fed animals, they they live on average to be 24, 25, 26 months old, whereas grain-finished steers are finished at 15, 16 months of age. So you're feeding these animals for a longer period of time, which increases the cost you're you have to you have more fee costs which but then like ultimately i also just like it because they live a longer life that's a huge plus for from a welfare perspective but with those extra costs then uh, then the you have to kind of push those costs down the road in, in order to still be profitable and then the consumer ultimately end up paying that price so if there is a weakness to regenerative agriculture that's what it is it's it's really it really amazing because um i feel like uh you know like a lot of farms are going towards the regenerative agriculture and you know times have been changing and people's over over uh, luck on health has been changing as well and uh we talked about many topics we we hit where um you know healthy diets and how healthy diets should include you know, different meats and different sources of nutrition in order to stay healthy. And that has a little bit of controversy because you have the the, um, the um, vegans and, and you have the uh, you have people who are vegetarians who feel differently. But um, you definitely see a difference with regenerative agriculture, the way they take care of the animals, um, the way they feed 
and and uh, they feed the animals. Um, how how every how the milk is healthier, the meats are healthier. Um, you know, because in in the in the past, you know, we've we've had lots of tests done. Children, you know, were um, go, you know, especially young ladies were going through menstruation at a very young age. Their hormones were changing. Um, you know, they were developing faster than the norm, and a lot of it had to do with the hormones they were putting in the cow's milk and the hormones that a lot of these commercial. Um, Farms were putting in um, the, the chickens, and they were putting in the uh, the animals, and uh, you know, so it's you know, regenerative agriculture is is definitely something that we need to com- you know have the the world convert to, and it seems like we are in the uh, right step because a lot of farms, um, you know, you're located in Ontario, where uh, but a lot of farms all over the place are starting to change the way they do things. Do you feel like that also? Yeah, it's a it's a massive trend, and it's a very positive trend too. And it's coming from the farming perspective, but also from the consumer end of things. There's, there's a push towards regenerative agriculture from both ends, and uh, it's great. It's a very powerful movement, and it's a very positive movement. And it's kind of coincides with the the, the consumers' demand for local products and trying to source their food from local farmers. And that's it's all. It's a very positive and an amazing trend. Uh, that I'd like to see continue. Um, but one of the things that uh, concerns me, though, is like when you when this part was was necessary for for this whole local scene is that the farmers need to uh, learn to market their products and and they have to sell their products direct to consumers. Mm-hmm. And I unfortunately see a lot of is basically a lot of um, explanations and a lot of of marketing or 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 just publicity and then and then they they speak in a way that kind of smears re, uh, commercial agriculture so there's, it seems like this there's this animosity on the on from the regenerative agriculture or just from local farmers that are trying to sell direct towards commercial agriculture and ultimately i don't think it's very productive right because if, if the goal is to take what we're what we're learning in regenerative agriculture and use that to feed the entire world, you kind of need commercial agriculture to come along for the ride. All yeah. those farmers and that that own these larger scale farms, or or not even necessarily just larger, but just are producing food for the commercial market, they're not just going to get up and disappear all of a sudden and make way for all these farmers that 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 are have a market for and and are able to market their products direct to consumer. They're not just going to disappear. So what would ultimately happen is like, yeah, your, your local farms that do a good job finding customers, they're going to grow to the point where they look a little more similar to a commercial farm. And then the commercial farms, they're not set in stone. They're not, it's not an unchanging business. Like, and, and like, as if you look even 10, 20, 30 years or, or 100 years, commercial agriculture is constantly changing and improving. And it's going to take tips and tricks and take those lessons from regenerative agriculture. And over time, we'll find ways to apply that to commercial agriculture. So then overall, like over time, these two movements are basically going to become one. And mm-hmm. that's the, ultimately the solution to feeding the world. It's not one or the other. It's commercial agriculture starting to resemble regenerative agriculture and adopt management practices that are more sustainable. And then the local regenerative farms growing to the point where they resemble the commercial farms and they become they find more efficiencies and um, they turn, start to scale up and drive the cost down ultimately of food that's produced in this way. I, I think you know our our society is on, on a on the right road, and if you know, I, I feel that it has to be um, ways that we can communicate with the commercial farms and make them see that regenerative agriculture is the way to go, and that it, overall it will benefit everybody. It will benefit them and the consumer as well. And have you seen any any of the farms and commercial farms uh, trying to communicate and trying to get together as one to try to make some type of compromises and changes in the farming industry? A lot of it is done through social media stuff of that and general education and putting the word out there. And there is lots there is lots of education with things that do work that are being taught to 
the average commercial farmer. Like I see a lot of information out, out there about rotational grazing and the benefits. And also there's an awful lot of information out there about things like cover cropping, like basically not having just monocrops, but having like um having other species planted together with those crop those cash crops, those monocrops and having it so you improve the diversity and there's a huge push towards less tillage, less disturbance in the soil, which is great for for yeah. regenerating culture and regenerating the regenerating, regenerating the soils. Mm -hmm. So like there's there's definitely a, a push towards it. And it and it also comes from the government too. Like the government is incentivizing these initiatives of trying to stimulate the purchases of, of different equipment that does less tillage or, or allows you for more species being planted at the same time. So I see I do see a lot of it. And is the problem is it's it's there's something that's usually missing. Like there's a lot of puzzle pieces that you need to follow in order for there to be true payback for those efforts. Right. And you look at regenerative agriculture, there's five principles that you typically try to follow. And that is you want to maximize the biodiversity on that land, the the plants and the insects and the animals. You want to minimize disturbances of any sort, and that can include tillage, but also just spraying with fertilizers or herbicides and pesticides. All of those um, impacts have a negative effect on the soil health and the biology, the, the, the microorganisms in the soil. And then you want to have living roots in the soil year round, mm. uh, which is really important because those microorganisms that where where the soil health really turns on and is really dependent for making the system work, they only live in association with living roots. So there's, if there's if there's devoid of life, if there's no living roots, well then the microorganisms can't grow either. Right. So that's really important. And then you also need to have some sort of armor on the soil. You can't just have bare soil. You need to have plants that are protecting the soil from the sunlight and preventing it from drying up. And and because like the dry hot soil microorganisms can't thrive in that environment either and then the last principle that you try to follow with regenerative agriculture is you have animal impact and we typically see in the regenerative space is you see farmers that produce animal products because when you have rotational grazing you naturally follow all of these principles yeah. it's, it's you almost do it by accident <laughs> uh, as long as you're rot rotationally grazing so that's typically what you see in the yeah. regenerative agriculture space, but you can apply these, excuse me, you can apply these principles not only to producing animal products, but also to producing fruits and vegetables and even row crops. You can take these principles and you can apply it. It's just more difficult and you have to be more intentional. But what I see typically with all these initiatives that are pushed by the government and farmers that are experimenting with it is they have their row crop system and then they'll say, okay, I'll plant some cover crops into that. And then they, they make that investment, they buy the seed, they fertilize it, whatever else. And then over time they say like, like well, I'm spending this extra money, but I'm not seeing anything in return because they're still dependent on that fertilizer. Yeah. Is there, there's not a massive improvement in soil organic matter. So like the commercial farmer, the typical one that's just, trying out these these initiatives that are being pushed doesn't get much results from it right they see it because they don't have all the puzzle pieces in place so unfortunately and then like there's there's research backing up that decision as well there's lots of research starting to come out now with because like these cover cropping has been a, a push for quite a while now there's results out now right and it's basically been shown that there is not really that much of an improvement in organic soil matter or or in the soil health. Like, so it's it's kind of hard for these farmers to justify that investment when there's no return. Because like, especially agriculture as a whole, but like farming, there's very low returns. You're you're working on a really small margin, so like, you it's it's difficult to justify those investments that when you don't really see a return. So it kind of peters out, and right. people kind of stick to what works. But like in order for it to work, you kind of you got almost the like commercial agriculture really needs to learn from the regenerative space and see what's working on a small scale and see how we can scale that up and right. um, put all the pieces together 
because that's what's missing. And, and, and it's something that I'm struggling with personally as well, because I'm trying to take what I'm learning from uh, the, the regenerative side of our farm and apply it to the commercial side of our farm. Right. And like a lot of the challenges are like you, in order to do things on a large scale, especially like with row cropping, you have this large equipment so that you can efficiently harvest your crops but all those heavy equipments, it comes with compaction and large wheels. And like that efficiency comes at a cost of doing some sort of damage to your soil, some right. sort of disturbance that you're trying to avoid. Um, and that's one of the principles of, of soil health. So like, and there's other realities as well. Like, like you, you want to have, in order to harvest your crops efficiently on, on a larger scale, you need to have a whole bunch of one crop ripe and ready to go at one time so mm -hmm. if you if, so you're basically you're pushed towards monocropping single species a lack of diversity so like it, it's it's a real challenge yeah and so like but there is hope because there is um a couple of scientists johnson and sue that developed a very unique way of composting mm -hmm. called johnson sue compost and when you compost it this way, you, you're really creating a unique environment for microorganisms to thrive, especially the fungal part of right. it, because fungus is typically the what's really missing in soils. They're still, even the, the, the soils that are very disturbed, they still have quite a population of bacteria. Right. Maybe not a population of bacteria, but there's a lot of bacteria there still. But you want to add the fungal life and then also the, the higher... Um, um categories of life in that food chain like the the worms and the insects but you want you need to add that to the soil to kind of kickstart it yes and what you can do with this johnson soup compost it's unique because you you provide a lot of organic matter a lot of carbon and then you don't turn it you don't disturb it in any way because as soon as you do the fungus dies off it's a fungal life that's very sensitive to disturbances of, in any way so it's basically what it looks like is you have a compost pile with with tubes in it and then um and then these tubes you can you can remove the the the, the tubes after the compost sets but okay. you have panels of, of oxygen coming into the compost and so you can have air constantly coming into the compost without turning it right and you let it for a very very long time you let it mature and then you end up with this amazingly um uh comp this amazing compost with a, has a huge uh concentration of of microorganisms in it and then you can take that compost and you can wash off the life you can wash the the microorganisms into something that you would call a tea yeah and then and then, and then you you have this liquid of biodiversity that you can apply to the field with your typical equipment wow. so you it, real opportunity to scale this up and you only need about a pound of compost per acre of land so like oh, wow. you can really you can really scale this up very very well and farmers are doing this they're they're experimenting with it and they're applying it and you when you have that diversity and you apply it even in, a, in, a, in an imperfect farm or imperfect system where yeah. you've done action you kick start that diversity that which would normally take years to build up with proper management right and also all at once and then all of a sudden you can have it you can start seeing the benefits of soil health quick yeah and what you see then is like now you have that diversity there now the plants as long as you don't apply first synthetic fertilizers that plant can now uh has that diversity of, of microorganisms in the soil where the plant can now asks can ask those microorganisms for nutrients right and you can have a system where you can get away from fertilizer you get a payback for your efforts mm -hmm. because you, you're no longer needing to buy as many synthetic fertilizers and then you and then you have a plant that has this relationship with the microorganisms and then you still need to apply the other principles as best you can you need to have food and protection and stuff like that uh and you need to have those living roots to keep yes. that life going but you kickstarted it so you can actually see the benefits of the cover cropping of the the minimum tillage or no tillage right. and you can have all those puzzle pieces together and you can start seeing the benefits where you can decrease your fertilizers you can have improved nutrient density of the food being produced because yeah because when you use synthetic fertilizer the plant no longer needs 
the microorganisms to get nutrients and no longer right. needs that relationship. The microorganisms die off. And the plant still grows because you're applying the synthetic fertilizers. You're giving it the minimum of what it needs to grow. But that is where that minimum of what like, is where you you create the lack of nutrient density in that food. Yeah. Because you can fertilizer for you can never fertilize for every single micronutrient that can be found in the soil. So that's where you run into problems. And that that new initiative like of innovation of this highly specific compost and applying it to your field, not necessarily, you're not applying nutrients, you're uh, applying biodiversity to the field. That I feel is a key to being able to scale this to the commercial farms and allowing these really large commercial farms to take a step towards regeneration and improving right. soil health and soil and really seeing it where you can produce a lot of food and produce it efficiently. And then that's really a case where everybody wins, where you have the 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 best of both worlds, where you have the efficiency mm. of scale and the efficiency of of just like of producing food um, in that way, and then but then so you have the lower cost for the consumer, yeah. But then you also have the benefits of the soil health and the environment and the the welfare of the animals, yeah. Uh, but like the one thing that would have to happen is a lot of these commercial farms. A consequence of them pushing for efficiency is that they also are typically hyper specialized. Okay. And one thing that you really see with regenerative agriculture is a more of a generalization. You'll see a one per one producer, one farm producing all sorts of different products. And it's it's it it's one of those principles of soil health where you want that biodiversity, which then leads to having a diverse source of income. Right. That's something that that uh, commercial agriculture can adopt, but but either by these farmers, these specialized farmers becoming more generalized, or more likely partnerships between farmers, where you have the ones that are specialized for certain like cow calf operations or or producing beef, and then the the, the crop farmer that specializes in producing just your, your soy and your beans and uh like and your corn and wheat and that's all they produce they, they can right. work together crop farmer can can plant cover crops for after the cash crop and then the the beef farmer can graze that and everybody wins the beef farmer has some feed for their cattle and then the the commercial um person that's producing all those row crops and the cash crops they have the benefits of of the manure from those cattle and from the improvements of, of their soil health by having that animal impact mm -hmm. wow is, is, are is the government getting involved where they're making some standard laws or they're making um commercial farms um go in a more natural route a more healthier route they are but like like i was saying before it's the 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 their initiatives are not quite working at the moment, okay. in, in my opinion. Yeah. So, so like, and they're not necessarily doing it by enforcing it with laws, but they're trying to stimulate um, the the adoption of things like cover cropping and minimum tillage or no tillage, and the purchase of they might they might um, help you with the purchase of certain equipment that allows for less tillage and stuff like that. That's like, but like the government, they unfortunately because regenerative agriculture is so new and the possibilities are, are still yet to be conclusively proven, especially at a, at a larger scale, yeah. the government really doesn't really know what to stimulate or how to stimulate it or what works and what doesn't because commercial agriculture doesn't even know yet. It's still basically a secret held by regenerative agriculture um, that needs to be applied further to, yeah. uh, and once you start seeing commercial farms adopt like especially like the the early adopters in commercial agriculture, yeah, adopt these regenerative practices, and then and then they start showing what works on a commercial scale. That's typically when the government will step in and say, "Oh, okay, we'll stimulate this uh, is for for broad adoption." Right. But yeah, there is a lot of push. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, political interest in in uh, more sustainable ways of producing food. Right. Uh, especially especially lately with a lot. of Political interest just in, in in the environment as a whole, and uh, a lot of those goals that people set for our um, emissions and stuff like that. That's good to know. And and for for consumers, 
Can you explain to consumers um, the benefits of having food from regenerative agriculture farms that that focus on regenerative agriculture? Yeah, there's a there's a measurable difference. There's a certain different ways that you can measure it. One is just like with a really quick and dirty, you can something called bricks meter where you can measure the sugar content of of liquids, okay. and you can see that there's way more solids in in liquid form. Um, in the sap of these plants that are produced with with regenerative management practices, and it's not just like the sugars; it's not just sweeter, um, because like the plant it uses sugars to transport minerals through the plant, and so so the sugars is a, is a pretty decent marker for overall nutrient density, not just the sugars. Yeah. And so you can measure the nutrient density, the amount of minerals and vitamins. Um, uh, using the the, sh the solid content as a proxy with his with these bricks meters, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but you can also measure it in a, in a more exact way. There's been research done where um, they've compared the the meat or the muscle of of these animals that are raised with regenerative practices, being grass fed and grass finished, to the ones that are the way that are typically raised and finished on just grain. And right. if they take a biopsy of the muscle of of these animals and compare the two of them. You see in the grass fed animals, you see less evidence of aging. It's, they're mm -hmm. healthier. Animals. You see less glycation and pro products, less proteolysis, less um, oxidative stress. And then not surprisingly, if you if you analyze these biopsies closer, that that translates into a healthier food. So you have more of your vitamin A and your vitamin E. And you have more omega-3 fatty acids. You have more just general minerals and stuff like that. But also there's um, things called phytonutrients that can be found oh. in a greater concentration. And phytonutrients are basically compounds that are originated from plants, but you can find them in the meat. And they have a long list of different benefits if you consume these phytonutrients. A lot of them are, are centered around being anti-inflammatory or antioxidants. Okay. Which um yeah, which is important because if you really look at the root cause of disease, many people say that it could potentially be inflammation as a root cause as yeah. of all diseases really being inflammation. So those those anti-inflammatories and those antioxidants, those 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 phytonutrients do play a big role. And what I find fascinating is that you don't only find phytonutrients from plants, you find the nutrients from the fungus and for the microorganisms in the soil that make its way all the way up the food chain to the meat that's on your plate. Wow. So and that, that's been measured with mass spectrometry. Like you can see the difference. It's not just theory. You can, you can measure it. Yeah. That's amazing. That that's truly amazing. Cause I think, I think people have to understand the difference because I think a lot of people, they just buy food and they don't really think about, you know, um, where the, you know, I think that it's, it's gotten better, but a lot of people don't realize when they're buying it from a farm, they automatically think, you know, it's going to be healthy, but they have to really know their farmer and understand how they're raising the food and what they're doing. You know, and, uh, and that makes a big difference on on a person's health, you know, is how how farmers are raising their food, how they're feeding their animals, how they're creating their plants. You know, it, it all has an impact when you put it in your body. Yeah, and if you look at like uh, the world population, especially in North America um, as a whole, there's a, a real issue with health and chronic disease, which mm -hmm. in my opinion stems from basically the general population being overfed, but yet being undernourished. Yes. So you're eating foods that are have calories, taste amazing, but are devoid of nutrition or have very low amounts of nutrition. Yes. So when I was talking about that you can make a difference in the nutrient density of food, that's getting at the root cause of all the chronic disease that we're seeing in the developed world. So like we need to move as a population away from all these hyper processed, hyper palatable yes. food and move towards eating just real whole foods. But then also those whole foods need to be produced in a way that they have that improved nutrient density that, that you would expect from whole foods where you, when you're trying to eat this way and eat it in a healthier way, where you're 
trying to maximize the nutrient density, you you want the food itself to max out that nutrient density as well because of the way it's managed and produced. Right, exactly. And I see, you know, a, a lot of problems. I, I see a lot of overweight people in the United States. I see um, when we go to restaurants, you they have very large portions, a lot of these restaurants, um, you know, and and there's a lot of processed foods in America. And uh, like we had talked in a previous, a couple of episodes ago, you know, in, in our country, um, when you go to other countries, a lot of the food that they make in, in America are banded in, in other countries. And uh, that tells you, you know, um, some facts right there, pretty scary ones. And um, people have to really understand where they're getting their food. And, you know, and, and I, I like farm markets. I like farm markets because, you know, you're getting a healthier version of, of a product and it's better for your body. But, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, the farm is, is you know, a regenerative farm that they're they're producing you know the the um the, the plants and the animals and the and and you know everything that they're selling is is create you know created in, in a healthy manner don't you think that's right yeah and yeah because like just because a farm is local doesn't necessarily mean that they're producing it with uh regenerative management practices it's yeah. a fairly recent trend and um, especially, like I said, like rotational grazing is pretty simple to follow the principles. But when you start buying products like fruits and vegetables, you must be far more intentional in the way to, in producing it so that you do follow regenerative agriculture. Like um, it's difficult, but not impossible to produce vegetables without tillage. Right. You do it basically by laying down a really deep bed of compost. And then you you grow your vegetables in that compost and then and then and then um and then you don't never actually have to till the soil so you can still produce your vegetables in a way where you're not tilling you're not um doing it in ways that that damage or 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 damage the soil in any way or decrease the organic matter or decrease the nutrient density of the food that's produced you can still use these principles you just have to be more intentional and it's not necessarily that common even yeah. amongst farms but it is possible to do it without tillage and then because like vegetables is especially farmers that specialize in growing vegetables it's unique in how much nutrients you're selling you basically you're you're growing vegetables and you're you're trying usually it's pretty dense so you're removing a lot of nutrition from the soil and in the form of vegetables and selling it to people so that's why it needs to be kind of you need to be careful on how you produce it and then so having this deep bed of compost where you're growing vegetables in as opposed to directly in the soil allows you to, and you can constantly top up this compost every couple of years or something like that. So it allows you to produce vegetables in a way where you're still benefiting the soil health. Right. Is there questions you should ask that you're a farmer if you go to a farmer's market? Are there specific things that you, you should ask? Yeah, you can, you can walk around and see like a, a good sign is that you, is a, there's a diverse uh amount of products um that's a good sign to start off with just from a distance but you can ask things um like for any animal products you ask like, hey were these animals rotationally grazed that'd be um a really easy question to ask that gives you a, an answer right away if it's regenerative or not and produce in a way that maximizes the nutrient density but for fruits and vegetables you can ask if there's if they till the soil because as soon as that, as you start doing that tillage, you're no longer following those regenerative practices, and it's not necessarily all of a sudden that that means that that food is completely devoid of nutrition. There's still there there are lots of gray areas, and it's, it's not black and white. There's there's still ways that you can produce food with tillage that improves the nutrient density. Um, like like organic production actually helps quite a bit with soil health. It does improve soil health to some degree. Um, yeah. Just not as much. It's not the the gold standard, basically, that we what you would have with no tillage and using like a lot of organic practices, even if it's not classified as organic. But right. that, those are my my two questions um, for for vegetables is is there tillage, and then for for animal products is it done raised with rotational grazing? Um, so whether it be pork, turkey, chicken, beef, that'd be what I would ask, and then. Right. Uh, yeah, and that, that would, basically those two questions would answer whether or not it's 
broadly following regenerative agriculture practices. Right. Now, if you had to sum up everything that we talked about today, what would you like to emphasize some takeaways you'd like to leave the audience with? I, I would hope that people are would um, listen to this and be optimistic for the future. Change is happening. Change is constantly happening. And I'm very optimistic with the future. And I, I have a pretty unique perspective on things because I grew up on, on a commercial farm and I'm moving towards regenerative practices. Change is happening. And uh, in my eyes, from, from my perspective, the future looks bright. The future looks positive. There is change happening. And these we're, we're we're breaking the 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 norms and we're learning from basically our weaknesses and yeah i'm excited and and i really feel like, like especially for commercial agriculture this this unique compost the johnson soup compost will play a key role in uh really improving the the not only the nutrient density of food but also the affordability of the nutrient dense food and what is can you tell us a little about your website moral eats and what it consists of and some of the services you provide moral eats is uh my passion project where uh the mission is really centered around improving animal welfare improving the lives of farm animals so we specialize very much on producing animal products so we have uh, grass-fed meats and uh, tur turkey, that's pasture turkey and pasture pork, as well as sustainably sourced seafood. And that's really what we specialize in. Just And like, everything that we produce and that we sell on our website is used as a vehicle for improving animal welfare. So I, I stumbled more on regenerative agriculture by accident when I was researching animal welfare and things that oh, I could okay. do. I could make and and I found that regenerative agriculture is, is a good way there's a lot of, just by following those principles is a good way to improve welfare as a whole as far as like longevity and also just uh, the experiences of those animals being out on pasture being able to have that experience that they didn't have before um, so yeah we have uh, like the, the price that we have available is like the grass-fed beef is it's rotationally grazed and there, it's unique because all of those animals are actually sourced from the dairy industry, right. which has greater opportunity if we take what's possible with with rotationally grazing and grass fed, grass finished beef, and using that on with the bull calves of the dairy industry, which normally is not possible yeah. because dairy animals are bred to the extreme for being being able to efficiently produce milk, but mm -hmm. ours are crossbred with beef animals. So they still have enough of that um, genetics from the beef side that they're I'm able to finish them on beef so that we can have those improvements in welfare that we see on from beef cows and use it to make a big difference in the welfare of the bull cows of the dairy industry. And then uh, we use similar uh, manner practices for our turkeys, which they follow behind our grass-fed beef. They, they, it mimics the natural systems that you would see where there'd be these massive herds of bison and all these wild birds following in behind these these herds and um, enjoying the nutrients like they're the turkeys they 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 eat the insects and stuff that are attracted to the manure of our of our grass-fed beef mm -hmm. and they also get to enjoy shorter grass because they're smaller animals they they have a hard time walking through really tall grass the the, right. the, the grass-fed beef they they make it a little shorter and then they they leave their manure behind and then the turkeys follow three days later. They eat the insects that are attracted to that manure. Mm -hmm. They walk through the shorter grass and they add their own manure to the mix, which is unique because it's very high in nitrogen. And uh, the grass really thrives off that nitrogen, which then in return benefits the steers once they come back around of this in this rotational grazing system. So then and then like also like uh the 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 pork is managed in a similar way where they're rotationally grazed and and also like the, the 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 seafood that we produce, it's all got like an MSC rating, which is mm -hmm. basically a, a proof of, of sustainability where these fisheries, they won't overfish when populations are are, are low. Yeah. They'll wait for, for it to rebound. And they also fish in ways that don't damage the 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 the, the ocean floors or the sea in the in some way or shape or, or another. So it's um 
Yeah, every basically all the more products we sell, the more that we improve welfare, the more that we improve sustainability. So it's I love it because it's a self-sustaining system. Yes. It 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 doesn't rely on donations. It is basically the the more money we make, the more of an improvement that we make on the environment and on welfare. It's um the gut the, the goals are very much aligned. Right. I love it. I love it. This is great. So, you know, I, I really thank you for coming on the show today. And before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to leave your listeners with? Um, uh, the, the main message I always try to, to leave people with is to vote with your food dollars. The, right. the best way, the, the, the most impactful way to in, in make a change in agriculture is through supply and demand. So mm -hmm. if you want to see a change in agriculture, make sure you're voting with your food dollars and that's the best way to make that change happen. That's the right. best way to make a difference and grow that that grassroots um, uh, movement of regenerative agriculture. And like it's like if you want to see more food produced that's nutrient dense, that improves the environment, and improves animal welfare, make sure you're shopping that and you're voting for that way of farming to continue. And then. And then also, like, like the more we do it, the more that that movement grows over yeah. time, there will be more efficiencies. There will be improvements in the scale and like, the overall cost of those products. Right. Wow. You know, I, I it's, it's a very exciting topic because I, I love when it, when it comes to health, I, I get very into it, you know, because it's so important that we feed our bodies with healthy foods and, and how it impacts our, our health. And like you said, our longevity, longevity you know, it, uh, you know, it's something that we really need to take more seriously because what we put in our body really affects our, our mind, our body and our, our health and longevity. So, you know, I thank you very much for coming on the show and, and sharing all this information. And I think the future will have, you know, uh, regenerative agriculture in it, you know, and it's going to become more and more and more popular as time goes on, because I think people are going to crave more for it. And people already are, you know, having a strong interest in healthier eating, healthier foods, where they get in their foods, what's in the foods. So people are becoming more cautious. So we definitely are in the, in the right, um, we're in the right step and the right path. So, you know, it's people like you who are helping make this happen. So thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. You too.